Scott, good evening. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in the same room with Sam, and um, I think we ought to commend Joe, too, because he tracked me down like a Delta team and <laughs> brought me home. Uh, and here I am. Uh, not, 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 not always an easy thing to do. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Sam mentioned the trip, uh, no, I guess it was you, Joe, mentioned the trip I went on with Jimmy Carter. Maybe I'll start with that, because in some ways it raises for me a lot of questions which have been circulating in my head and which are causing me and many, many other people uh, in the world in which I inhabit, whether they're professors, journalists, diplomats, business people, NGO operators in China. You know, to ask the question, uh, despite the fact that China is an incredibly important country, that's had a miraculous development, and is now clearly with the U.S., uh, one of the only two countries in the world that, you know, truly matter. We are at the top of the food chain. If we don't get together on things, things won't get done. Despite that fact, and that's a very compelling argument to work it out. I have increasing doubts about our ability to do just that. And because of that, I find ourselves perched at what I think is a quite alarming and also quite dangerous moment in history, where things are shifting to sort of the old, it's as if the old geological sort of structure of things were having this major sort of tectonic uh, rearrangement and we don't quite know how we feel about it, we don't quite know how to respond to it, we don't quite know what angle of repose we should find towards each other. Now, Jimmy Carter went to China and Xi Jinping asked to see him. This was part of the trip I accompanied him on. And Xi Jinping, who, as you all know, is a much more forceful leader than we've seen in a long time. You look at his face, Sam and I were talking at dinner. It gives away nothing. It gives away nothing. There's no glad handing, there's no smiling, there's no reacting. He is like the Mona Lisa, frozen in place. And it is a very, creates a very sort of powerful image, a sort of implacable image, like Mao Zedong on Tiananmen uh, in Beijing, that big portrait that hangs in the He called Jimmy Carter in and he said, uh, President Carter, no more of this democracy stuff. No more of these village elections. Now, Jimmy Carter had recognized China in 1979. Deng Xiaoping had come to this country. They got quite close together. It was a marvelous thing to see those two men together. There was real chemistry. They wanted to get things done, and they did. And Deng Xiaoping suggested to Carter in the Carter Center uh, afterwards, why don't you come and help us monitor and, and oversee <clears throat> and advise on the formation of a new kind of village election structure. So nonpartisan, no parties, but that the villages should get to elect their own leaders. They did this because the villages were in chaos after the Cultural Revolution. And Carter said, great. And off they went. <clears throat> and for many, many years, they went and they had a tremendous amount of experience in the ports, this, that, and the other, uh, in rural China, watching this incredible foment happen. And the hope was, of course, that these kinds of basically democratic forms of governance would slowly creep up. People watched and watched and watched to see, would it move up to the county level? Could it move up to the provincial level? And during the 1980s, <coughs> a period of immense openness, enormous excitement. Deng Xiaoping was in power, the party general secretaries, Hu Yabang, Zhao Ziyang, very experimental and, and, and open people. These were quite promising times. And everybody thought, well, after the long, deep freeze of the Cultural Revolution and Chairman Mao, they're coming around. Things have changed. And if we just get in there, uh, I remember businessman after businessman after businessman saying to me, 
just get in with the free market, just get in with the little Adam Smith laissez-faire, and it'll all just come up roses. Next thing you know, they'll be democratic, you know, uh, open markets ineluctably lead to open societies, was the presumption. Well, that is a presumption that turned out to be quite the myth. It has not happened. So Jimmy Carter was said, get, get rid of this stuff. We don't want you meddling around down there in the villages. This is not on the program now. <clears throat> and Jimmy Carter said, well, what should I do? It also happened at that time a film came out in China, which really criticized uh, the Carter Center, the Ford Foundation, other places as a sort of conspiratorial hands and gloves seeking to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party and its system of rule in China. It was a very dark sort of uh, 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 presentation of the effort of American NGOs to not just to do good, but to get rid of the Communist Party. So it looked like lights might be out for them. Xi Jinping said to Carter, work on US-China relations. Carter said, fine. Had a big conference. The ambassadors came down. It was a big new Brzezinski came down. They had a big, big wingding. And, and off Carter was going to work on US-China relations. Off to China to celebrate the 35th anniversary of opening up what had been this period of complete detachment. They had nothing to do with China, no ambassadorial representation. Citizens couldn't go there. And so it came time. Carter was turning 90. It probably looked like it would be his last trip to China. He wanted to go and celebrate what he had done. And if there's anybody who ranks with Kissinger up there in the pantheon of worthy leaders when it comes to having toiled in the vineyards of US-China relations and accomplished something, it is Jimmy Carter. So he asked me if I'd like to go. I said, sure. So, well and good. I went down to the conference. Then about a week before our trip, a call came in. The call uh, was from the uh, man who runs his China program. And he said they had been informed by the Chinese that, well, they had a little conference, sort of off the record, closed door in the Great Hall of the People. They wanted to do for a day to, to look at various aspects of the relationship since recognition. They said, um, Mr. Shell is not permitted to speak in the Great Hall of the People. Okay. Uh, I had other problems like this. Most writers, journalists, many academics have had similar problems like this. If you write something that the party takes umbrage at, you're liable to be punished. So I said, in that case, obviously, I won't come. Carter said, no, no, no. Uh, you should come anyway. I think he was reluctant to appear to throw a member of his, his trip out of the helicopter just because the Chinese wouldn't count in its uh, participation. So he said, you come. So I said, well, let me think about it. And then I was talking to some friends, and they said, listen, they said, remember, you were there in 1979. You went to Washington when Deng Xiaoping came to America for the first time. What a trip that was. Went to Atlanta, went down to Houston. We went to a rodeo, and there's Deng Xiaoping sitting in the arena at the rodeo on this busty, beautiful, glossy-lipped, Cowgirl rides up on a quarter horse and slaps a 10 gallon hat on Deng Xiaoping's head. I thought the place was going to come unhinged. That was, the, that was the way you show the world you're ready to deal. You're ready for relations to get better. Not Xi Jinping with smile, dim smile, reserved behind an implacable and read, readable visage. So, uh, I thought, yes, that's interesting. I was there. Maybe I should go with Jimmy Carter back and write something about what it's like 35 years later, what's happened since, how, did, how are we doing? So off I went. To my utter astonishment, I'll end the story here, uh, they did not treat him well. He didn't meet any leader of consequence. No one from the Standing Committee of the Politburo or the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. 
They kept canceling things on him, moving him around. And at one point, he said, he got so angry, he was ready to come home. He said, he's a man of decorum, he's a diplomat, <clears throat> and it worked out. And he didn't want to jeopardize his problem. Well, I came back and I wrote about it. And it, in writing about it, uh, of course, I had to wonder what was going on. Why was it? If, you know, we all hope we can collaborate and cooperate together, and the Chinese government is always talking about mutual trust, <coughs> friendship, they have organizations, friendship this, friendship that, the People's Association for Friendship with so-and-so and such and such. If this is true, where was the friendship? What an incomparable opportunity when the architect of the whole relationship comes to China to embrace him a very short time before the presidents are going to meet in the summit. What was going on? Well, it, it made me start to, to really re-examine everything. And I would have to say, since Xi Jinping came into power, when we still had much hope, and many good-hearted uh, humanists, liberals, people of goodwill in this country, uh, thought we really did need to do everything possible to find a way to work together with China. And I, I believe that. Believe that. I, I believed it, and I do I believe it now? I, I want it to be true. But I'm beginning, as I said at the outset, to wonder whether it can be true. What was going on uh, with Jimmy Carter is very hard to figure out. I think a couple of things might have been going on. One, he was a president who was known for human rights and democracy. That's a big demerit right now. Two, he had a whole project in village democracy and elections. Another demerit. And third, I had the very sort of unwelcome feeling, really, that what the Chinese government was doing, in part, was in a certain sense saying, oh, the president long, long ago has been, you know, why should we bother spending a lot of energy celebrating him? Why? Because they could. Because now the country is powerful enough, wealthy enough, people are eating out of its hand, businessmen want to go there because they can't ignore the market, universities are going there because the country has a very important, significant history, philosophical tradition, literature, role in the world. Everybody has a reason. And I think we see in this country, having developed in the last four or five years, really, a kind of a, a gathering sense of arrogance that looks like confidence and sits on top of an edifice of deep uncertainty, both historically speaking and because the, even despite their amazing success, and my hat is off to the country in terms of all it's done by way of development, they still no, the problems are extraordinarily deep and structural. It's not like the United States, which has big problems, but basically they're not so structural. It's just crazy people not being able to get stuff done. And, you know, that's a human problem, not a structural problem. So I think we are running into a um, a time which we begin to see reflected more and more in the posture, the deportment, and the policies of China that say, um, you know, don't mess with us. Uh, it's our way or no way. We're big, we're bad, we're wealthy, and we're back. And we are not compromising. You will remember, it was not many years ago, you know, I remember going on a trip with President Clinton, uh, many other trips to China. You know, before a president went one with, with, with George Bush, 
uh, you know, we would always sort of in our imperious American way sort of start lecturing the Chinese about human rights. Yes, I believe in human rights. I do. Deeply. But we would lecture with them uh, you know, about it and say, if you don't release X, Y, and Z, these 10, 12, 20 prisoners, uh, you know, we're not going to do this. The president won't come. We won't give you a 21-gun salute. Uh, on and on and on. And what would happen? The Chinese would yield. They would give in. And there was an expression back then which really said it all. And Deng Xiaoping was the one who lofted it as he architected the early stages of an extraordinary sort of economic development, but not political development. And it was, in Chinese, it's Tao Guang Yang Hui, which means you, you, hide your, you keep your head down and you bide your time. And we in the West heard that and were soothed by it. We thought, oh, how nice. The Chinese are not going to get up at you know, they're going to kind of just, they just want to be left alone to do their little old development thing at home. And don't get alarmed. Don't get worried. Don't get pushed out of shape. We're not competing. We're not going to make trouble around the world. And, but in actuality, that was not what that phrase actually means. Because all of these Chengyu, these phrases in Chinese, have deep sort of historical uh, roots. They have stories behind them. And every Chinese will know what the story is, and every foreigner won't. The foreigner will just hear it on the face of it, but the Chinese will understand, okay, this is, you know, back in the warring states period, you know, feudatory X was fighting feudatory Y, and this, that, and the other happened. What was really being said was, you hide your head and you bide your time until that day when you're when you have, it's on the cover of our book, Fu Chang, Wealth and Power. Then you stick your head up. Then you let folks know what you're about. Uh, I think we missed those cues completely. Then they had another phrase, He Ding Jie Qi, Peaceful Rise. Remember that? You probably read it in the papers. Oh, we thought, how nice. These lovely, peaceful Chinese, they're going to have their little rise and no big problem here. They don't use that term anymore. And indeed, uh, I think quite pointedly. So we are at a point where historically it's taken China 150 years. It is something they've never forgotten. There is a, another Cheng Yi, uh, another a phrase with a long story about this guy who it's long and complicated, I won't go into it, but he gets captured by one state, his state gets taken over, and what does he do? He's, of course, very angry, very offended, and he's very humiliated. He's been beaten. Go Jian, his name is. And he goes over to this other state, and he serves the king of that state as a slave, abjectly as a slave. Totally subservient obedient, not a scintilla of evidence of any insubordination or any defiance. But he makes a bed out of himself, for himself, out of uh, it's kind of thorns and sticks, a you know, really unpleasant thing to have to sleep on. And he hangs over that bed a string with a bitter gallbladder tied to it. And every night, <coughs> He forces himself, as he's lying on his bed of sticks and thorns, to lick that bitter gall. Why? To remember. He's going to get eaten. And lo and behold, he does. He comes back and he conquers the country in which he was sort of enslaved. And everyone knows this story. This was one of John Kai Shek's favorite stories in his diary. It's filled with references to this guy, Go Jen, because John Kai Shek, too, felt humiliated by the West, the unequal treaties, the Japanese occupation. He felt he was on a bed of thorns, licking a gall, humiliated. And there was nothing he could do about it. But the Go Jen story suggests you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait until you can do something about it. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at that moment. 
And we see this manifested in many, many ways. We see it manifested in the $400 billion oil and gas deal China recently signed with Russia, and Xi Jinping made another trip to Moscow recently. <coughs> Not that he loves the Russians invading the Ukraine per se, but he really likes Putin's kind of in-your-face sort of thuggery. It marches over a border and says, you know, to the wishy-washy, limp-wristed, liberal West, okay, guys, what are you going to do about it? And the answer basically is nothing. He liked that. And that's what he's doing in the South China Sea. And that's what he's doing with the Sengaku, the Gyalu Islands that they're in contention with uh, Japan of. They're moving. They're acting. They're not messing around. They're not waiting to have a lot of liberal, you know, kind of uh, negotiations and discussions of what carries off doing in Iran. They're just going to do what they want to do, and, and we don't like it. Well, all right. What are you going to do? This is almost a metaphor, I think, for the way in which China, in many, many ways, although not entirely, is deporting itself now in the world. It is saying, this is what we want, this is our interest, this is the way we're going to do it, what are you going to do about it? And it confronts the United States, which is the only power left in the world, the world of any consequence, and Europe is a dish of loose sand, uh, with an incredible dilemma. If you believe, as most Americans of intelligence and, and good good heart do, that we have to, we ought to, should, must make every effort possible to deal with China, are we ready to arch our backs? Are we ready to oppose them? Ashton Carter, the new Secretary of Defense, suggested maybe we'd be sending some some ships into the South China Sea to sail right through these bloody archipelagos of islands. China built one island, 2,000 acres, by pumping sand off the floor of the sea and then building a, an airstrip on which 747s can land. And they say, don't worry about it. This is going to be good for sea rescue. <laughs> it's also a pretty good thing if you're in a war. Uh, to have a nice little uh, you know, permanent aircraft carrier halfway to Indonesia. We look on the map. You will laugh when you see this. There's China, here's Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines. The nine-dash line comes down like this. It's called the cow's tongue. Licks all the way down almost to Indonesia, and the Chinese have basically said, ours. Yeah. Our sovereign territory. On the basis of what? Well, on the basis of some rather flimsy maps, uh, you know, from... 30s and 40s. The truth is it is sort of uncontested territory. And these are rocks sticking up out of the ocean. So the question of sovereignty had never really come up. Very complicated. Philippines took them to the law of the sea court. We'll see what happens. Vietnam's very upset. Malaysia's brutal. Um, everybody's quite, quite alarmed by the way China's projected itself. So if this is sort of more manifestations of China's new muscular, uh, nationalistic uh, forcefulness, and we have one nice little border dispute that hasn't been solved, and you know where that is, it's in India, between India and China up in the Himalayas. And there was a war there in 1962, and they've been battling over it ever since. Uh, Narendra Modi was just in Beijing. What's all that? What, how, how's that going to shake out? India and China, that's another very interesting question. But the words that China uses now are not sure, the higher good, larger interest. We recognize we got to figure this out in a way which won't lead to tensions and possibly war. No, what they said, this is unshakably irredeemably ours, we will not yield an inch, and we will not even negotiate with anybody but each of the little powers in the South China Sea separately. And the U.S. has no right to be involved in any way. 
And you do have to ask yourself, what right do we have? Well, we have the right that we've had the Seventh Fleet out there for over half a century. But it isn't a sovereign right. We have treaty obligations in the Philippines and Japan. But it creates a real dilemma in terms of not just American response, but in terms of a real dilemma in terms of, you know, are we still a great power? And if we are a great power, what does that require of us? How do we act in a mature, responsible, constructive, but not a sort of surrender monkey fashion? That's the question. And I cannot believe that this question will not come up in the election. It already has. And when it does come up, you can only imagine in your sort of most, you know, unwelcome nightmare the chorus of voices that you will hear on the Republican side of the aisle from the however many candidates it is they have running. I mean, you're going to have some really interesting policy prescriptions lofted by some of these characters who probably don't even own passports. <laughs> so we, are, we may kind of, we, we, we are going to be pushed into this. There is really not a lot of time left, I think, for us to deliberate. We've been wrapped up in the Middle East, and now China is saying, you know, while you're when the cat's away, the mice will play. And we are at the time where a reaction is responsible and necessary. I was in Washington 10 days ago talking to various people in the White House, the State Department, Congress. Everybody felt something was wrong. Everybody felt something was out of whack, out of balance. Nobody knew what to do with that. And everyone was fearful that if the United States responded, and this is because China is engaging in brinksmanship just like Putin, that their reaction would be so vitriolic and severe that our ability to cooperate on other things and our ability to work out this extremely important commercial, military, environmental, or you name it, uh, relationship would come across. But it seems to me, uh, at, some time, at some point in the near future, there will be a response. There must be a response, uh, because otherwise um, it is an invitation uh, to just for more. Why is Vietnam turning to America? This is our former enemy. Why are the Philippines begging us? Why is Japan buddying up to us? Because they're afraid. Because they're weak, small countries that aren't capable of, of standing up to a giant like China. So this makes a tremendously fraught, tremendously sensitive, and very dangerous situation in Asia. And we're all snarled up with ISIS. And wrapped up with Iran. And, you know, sort of off balance in the Ukraine. And there's nobody in our government who really cares about China. Kerry hasn't got time for it. Susan Rice, the National Security Advisor, went to China last fall for the first time in her entire life. The Secretary of State for East Asia is a Japan specialist. Smart guy, but you know. And the White House has nobody any of you could name. You know, where's Hank Paulson when we need him? You know, where's, uh, where's Stephen Chu? Where are these middle-tier people that used to serve as our sort of the musculature between to below the levels of the president? We used to have people like that. Uh, even Hillary Clinton, um, you know, sort of gave up. When she came into office, remember what she did? She said, we shouldn't let human rights stand in the way of us working together with China and other issues. An incredible concession. She said we want to do business. And remember, she wanted to hit the reset button with Russia? That was some pipe dreaming. But the Chinese didn't respond. And she's very frustrated. She may be back in office. What's she going to do? I don't know. I'm not even sure I know what to recommend that she do. Which is even more dangerous than if perhaps 
people like me did know. So maybe we'll end here and have some time for questions. I simply want to leave you on the, the note that we are at an inflection point with probably the most important other country in the world today. It's a completely different political system, a completely different value system. The old myth that if we just educate them over here, bring them over as grad students, you know, bring them over as agricultural, you know, tours such as Xi Jinping came on to Iowa, if we just have open markets, do cultural exchanges, all these nice fuzzy things, you know, they're just going to turn into be nice Democrats like us. <clears throat> Not going to happen. Not going to happen. What are they going to turn into? I don't know. But probably something very similar to the way they have been over the past 4,000 years, which is a nice imperial system with an emperor. And some variation on that. They call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. They really mean Leninism with Chinese characteristics. There's precious little socialism left. So this is a, a moment. It's a moment that will beg all of us. We actually, although we sometimes forget it, are the great fundament, allegedly, on which our government is based. We are the electorate. We cast the votes. We choose the leaders. And if we don't know what we're talking about, we're going to get leaders who are up to our standards. Ridiculous. So I think you, it, it is required that we pay attention and learn more. And finally, let me just say, I think you cannot understand what China is up to, why it's doing these things, unless you understand its history. Unless you understand its grievances, its narrative of victimization by the West, by Japan, by the great imperial powers of the past, and it was bitter, uh, how this keeps surging through the bloodstream of China, keeps being used to sort of remind people of China's humiliation. And now that China does not need to tolerate it, it does need to lick that gall, sleeping on a bed of thorns. It can stand up, have a nice soft bed, you know, have what it wants, do what it wants, and wait and see what the world's going to do about it. And that's really where we are today. A totally new power alignment. And the stakes are extremely high. Not the least of which, of course, is uh, climate change. Because if the U.S. and China don't get together, two biggest carbon emitters in the world, there will be no solution. And if there's no solution to that, all the rest of this may be somewhat academic. A lot of China will be underwater. New York subway system will be flooded. Everybody will be out here in Denver, 5,000 feet up in the air. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, so, you know, we should not be rash, we should not be childish, we should not be overly emotional as we figure out how to respond to China. If we're going to be a power that leads, and sometimes America has led very well, and sometimes very poorly, but if we're going to be a power that leads well, we better get ready. And we better figure this one out, and we better elect some smart, able people and give them the mandate to work in our behalf, in the world's behalf, to send some signals to China, what are the limits, what are the boundaries, but at the same time, to make it abundantly clear we want to work with them, will work with them, and we recognize that while we have separate national interests, we also have a vast and, you know, inescapable common interest. And I do believe that. Whether we'll get to it, well, that I'm a little less sanguine about. It. Okay, let's stop here. I'd be glad to take your questions. One of those inescapable common interests that you mentioned is that of uh, climate. Uh, and this um, transformed uh, face that you're uh, uh, painting here, how do you see negotiations on climate uh, moving forward? 
Well, on climate, you know, all the areas that actually where we have a common interest, this, I think, is the most important and also is probably the most hopeful. Because our presidents have signed an agreement <clears throat> to set, you know, carbon emission targets. And they have agreed to work together. We do have this giant global climate conference opening in Paris in late November, early December. <coughs> I believe Obama will go, and I wouldn't be surprised if she can think she was up. And if they are actually ready to do some business on that front, it would be incredibly encouraging. And it is an area where I think what we have to do is learn how to say, okay, there's a lot we don't agree on. We're well, not going to figure that out right away. What are the things that are urgently important that we possibly can work on? and figure out, and climate change would be right at the top of the list. So I, I look at that as a very hopeful prospect. I'd be interested in your thoughts on the fact that China's building these small cities or towns, maybe you want to call them, with many residential buildings <coughs> and commercial buildings and nobody's in them. They're empty. Uh, uh, big apartment buildings and stores where nobody is there. What, what is your reaction to that? Well, you have to understand, in China, there is a fateful combination we don't have here. First of all, when the communists came to power in 1949, they confiscated all real property from private ownership and abolished private property. And there is no private property in China. There's no law. And so the state owns the property. When economic reforms began, they began, oh, thank you so much. They began uh, feeding this property, which they had confiscated for nothing, back into the market to make money. And this is the way a lot of local governments support themselves. You know, they'll take the land that the peasants or whoever was on it, and they'll just say, you know, give you a little money, get off, and we're going to sell it for a shopping mall, for a stadium or a hotel or something. The other thing is, it owns the, pro the property, it also owns the banks. Now, every deal that happens in China, uh, this is a bit of a long-winded answer, but I'll try to make it short, happens by putting property together with, with money. How many of you are property developers here? Well, uh, must be some of you. Uh, and both of those positions are occupied by bureaucrats from the Chinese Communist Party of state-owned enterprises with low salaries. And if they're going to get paid, they're going to have to rake something off on the side. This means they have, and so do the governments, great incentives to build, put stuff up. So they build a lot of buildings, mostly at the high end. They need, urgently need buildings at the low end for residents, for poor people. But at the high end, because they could, they personally profited by doing it. Their local jurisdictions were urged to develop and make things look like they were joining the fun uh, and doing something, and they did. So that's how that, all that happened. Now, it, it is a very precarious situation. There's some signs that the property bubble was easing a little, which isn't surprising with so many people that they might grow into it. But it is a big problem. But this is what happens in economies where markets are not sort of completely in control. You get these strange, anomalous, bubble-like things happening. There's one in the stock market now going on. It's doubled in, I don't know how many months it was. And because government policies cause it to chip people to invest in it. So these things, this, is, this is why Xi Jinping says we've got to reform the economy. Because uh, he's worried that if you have this interference always by the state, you'll get these distortions. And these anomalies. It could bring the whole economy down. <laughs> you seem to have been spending some time in and around Washington. Do you think there is anybody in our government, from the president down to the Congress, who is now willing to take over leadership of the world, or are we just a bunch of chickens sitting on the sideline? <laughs> well, the first thing you have to say, I think the chickens are really in Congress. Uh, and they are one of the things that sort of sidelined our government in significant ways. Because our government can't sign a treaty, it can't do much of anything because Congress can't agree on anything. That's a real problem. 
<coughs> you can fault Obama on many things, and I do. I think we all do. Uh, but every president has that dilemma. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like what's going on in China, indeed anywhere in the world, I and mean, even the Ukraine, what would you have us do? You know, what should Obama do? Should he send troops in and start another war? By moral right, he should. By any justification of the invasion of one country of another, you know, we might go to aid of Ukraine, which is now a putative democracy, but we're not going to do it because we're afraid. And we're afraid with reason. It's not foolish to be afraid of someone like Putin. He is a thug. And his bread is buttered on the side of thugger. And, you know, he will retaliate because that's how he stays in power. That's a really dangerous situation. And I think the same is, is true in, in somewhat different way with China. They have this incredible issue with face. Once they commit themselves to a policy, they will not back down. And if they do, the humiliation just goes deeper. So that makes it very hard to negotiate. You know, things maybe, you give or take a little bit, sometimes you can get something, but it means that, that it's very hard to work with China because it's so hard for China to conceive anything. So, you know, I don't want to make it sound like <coughs> I'm disturbed with the lack of American leadership too. But it's easy to sit on the sides and cart, and I do. It's very difficult to know what the remedy is. You know, that wouldn't send the world up in a cloud of smoke. And you're dealing with some very, very, very bad actors who have nothing left, North Korea for instance, you know, except to blow the place up. It brings me shit. It, it, it's scary. And I think in Russia and China, we have two countries that are willing to go, and many, you go to China, many, you, many people say, bring it on. Remember George Bush? Well, they did bring it on, and we're still suffering from it. So I think you have to be very careful before you react, as I think you or I might sort of spontaneously wish we could, because it seems so unseemly just to let people do things like this. And yet, the consequences can be so grave that I, I, I've learned sometimes to temper my own self a little bit, uh, particularly in regard to China. You, you feel very strongly one way, but you know, maybe later on you understand you didn't get have it quite right. This is delicate stuff. It takes people who do nothing but this day and night. We should have someone, you know, doing nothing but going back and forth like Kissinger used to, or Kerry, between Palestine and Israel, between Japan and Korea, and work out their problem. They're our allies, for heaven's sake. And they hate each other. There are a lot of things we could do we're not doing. But we're so snarled up in Afghanistan, in Iraq, North Africa. I mean, we've been just not paying attention. But listen, McCain wanted us to go back into Iraq, remember? Was that right? Was that wrong? <laughs> complacency have not been a stranger to those uh, sub nations who have come to wealth and power. Yeah. And wealth and power are very seductive and can deteriorate in that direction. And it's possibly likely that China will come along that same way. Now the United States has always felt that it can always retreat to its can of spinach, like Popeye, get, get its act back together. And uh, my, I guess my, what I'm wondering is, why don't the two big guys on the block just kind of figure it out and divide up the spoils? Well, I mean, you know, well, you might ask, and they've tried. You know, and they've had these meetings, and they, the whole idea was, let's just sit it down, take our jackets off, roll up our sleeves, and, and get on with it, and figure out who's got what, you know, uh, and they can't do it. 
because you know uh, what what Obama can't give away the Philippines. You know, it, it's very hard. Uh, but you know, this is the way real leaders actually do work. One of the problems, and I've observed this up close. I mean, I've been following this for too damn long. Sometimes I think I need a new country. Um, you know, the leaders that don't enjoy each other's company. When I was there with Clinton, he and John Zeman, John Zeman was kind of a foolish fellow, we thought at the time. Now we see him as a little more artful than we did then. But he was, he wanted to play. I mean, when I, not play like a, like a child. He wanted to play in the big top. He was reciting the Gettysburg Address in English. He was singing Solo Mio. I went to a press conference in the Great Hall of the People with Clinton and John Smith, which is utterly unimaginable now. And we walked in to this big room. Clinton and John Smith were arm in arm going up the steps of the Great Hall of the People. You know, you know how Clinton is. He could charm the pants off a communist any day. <laughs> they got into the big hall, we all sat down, and we were struck dumb when the announcer said, this press conference will be broadcast live all across China in real time over radio and television. <laughs> what? That should never happen. And up gets John Zemin with Clinton. Clinton's going on and on, you know, good old boy stuff. And uh, uh, John Zemin is trying to keep up with him. He's doing a pretty good job. And John Zemin made the fateful error at one point. He said, you know, he said, when I was in New York, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I saw a lot of these Americans interested in Lamaism, you know, Tibetan Buddhism. So what's all that about? I thought you were a modern scientific country. You know, he views Lamaism, Tibetan Buddhism, as ancient kind of retrograde superstition, you know. And well, Clinton gets going. And, oh my Lord in heaven, he, he, he's, he was talking about Tibet and going on and on and on about, you know, freedom of speech and whatnot. And then finally John Zwin was getting a little panicked. And he kind of grabbed the podium, I remember. And he, he said, well, he said, if the President of the United States agrees, maybe we'll end this portion of the discussion. And Clinton said, no, he said, I want to tell my friend John Smith, I just want to say this, if you ever had a chance to meet the Dalai Lama, I think he'd really like it. <laughs> you know, at that point, John Smith dove back into the script. But he gave it a good run. He really did try, and you could see he, he, they enjoyed the banter, the, the interaction. They, they were two guys that sort of respected, liked, and were intrigued with each other. And, you know, things weren't so bad. <clears throat> the guys today, nothing. It's, it's a flat line. There's no personal inter interaction whatsoever. And no, nobody knows anybody. Buddy. There's, you know, they had all... all uh, Biden out there for a while, you know, when, when Xi Jinping was vice president. And God, you know, I went on a trip with him and Xi Jinping and watching those two together. You know, Joe is a force of his own, you know, had his arm around Xi Jinping most of the time and big old grin on his face and, you know, slapping his back and telling him stories. And I thought this was sort of the perfect antidote, but it didn't work out. They finally didn't really get along that well, and she didn't melt at all. I watched his face, nothing. Nothing. He wasn't giving away anything. So, I don't know. You know, I, I don't see any chemistry. All I see is people very frightened of stepping off the wrong sort of policy, making a mistake, being very careful, arguing in kind of very diplomatic, rigid terms, and getting nowhere. And I don't know what the remedy is. Got another question in back? Uh, I'd just like to ask a quick, short question to give an indication. I think China's culture is very different than the United States culture. For all the years that we've been here, for the 72 years I've been here, the United States has been the top power. And we have been arrogant. I mean, we, and what's happened is you look at all the Western <laughs> countries, whether Europe or Japan or the United States, 
Capitalism really isn't working the way it did. And China's got a different way. Yeah. I mean, in one way, just as a question is, I got two questions. One is, how many time zones does China have? And two is, exactly. you know, one, one time zone for a giant country. And so they do it a different way than we do. I mean, it's just an indication of a different culture. If I were going to ask what China's going to do, is I look to the 4,000 years of what China has done, not from our perspective, but from their perspective. And the final question I got is the UN, is it time to close the UN? Ah, uh, the UN. No, I don't think it's time. Let's just deal with that one first. Uh, I mean, listen, we don't have a lot of organizations that can do the kinds of things that really this new globalized world of interdependence demands and requires. Uh, we're living in a world where sovereignty is not what it was because you have immigration, migrants, you have Ebola, you have nuclear weapons, you've got trade, you've got all of these things which require some sort of, of uh, you know, management. So I, your UN is not a very efficient organization, I know, but I, I don't think that the, the, the remedy lies in getting rid of it. Um, I think you raise a very interesting question about uh, the failure of capitalism. I think we, we've seen certain failures of capitalism. We've also seen a lot of regenerative powers of capitalism. It's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, <clears throat> but I think what you really do see is uh, China used to sort of advertise itself as in transition. And from Sun Yat-sen, who stayed right down here in the hotel I was in at lunch, uh, on down, uh, you know, the idea always was that you'd have phases. You know, military dictatorship, you'd have constitution, you'd have a guided democracy, then you'd have constitutionalism. Chiang Kai-shek thought, thought the same thing. Don't push us, don't make us go too fast, but we're going to get to a kind of a more democratic form of government the West would recognize. Uh, and, and, you know, even Deng Xiaoping, Zhao Ziyang, these guys in the 80s sort of had that, there was that idea. They were in a phase, in a transition, don't push too hard, eventually they would get more and more open and free. And they didn't eschew that idea. Now they do. Now they say, that's not where we're going. We're not in your teleology. We're not in Hegel land, where everybody's going towards the supreme ultimate of greater openness and whatever else Hegel was talking about. They say, we're going in our own, own direction. And in fact, although they haven't quite said it yet, uh, there are intimations that they may think they're already there, that they've developed a new model. State capitalism, call it what you will, Leninist marketization, there are many, many different names for it. And that in a certain sense, it's more effective. And many people in this country look at it and say, whoa, yeah, not bad. I mean, maybe we need a little of that. And some are even, some businessmen even, I hear, rather, rather uh, you know, denigrating our system and thinking it'd be nice to be over there in China. Well, some of them are. I don't know how they want to, like to live there, but they're making some money there. So we're in another world here, too, where there's a different model for how you do things. And other countries are looking at this. Putin's sniffing around this model. Putin's a, the country's a mess. He's looking at what the Chinese did and said, you know, I could use a little of this. Nice, strong leadership, one party, high growth rates. You know, how, how, how do we get some of this? So it, it, it's, we do have a kind of a, we, the end of history has ended. You know, where we won, liberal democracy won, that ended. And then we're now in this new world where we have a kind of a bifurcation in the road. And one model is China's, and one model is, well, I don't know, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, Canada, the United States. And we'll see. I still believe that the Chinese system is so bloody brittle. It's wound up so tight. It depends so much on control, surveillance, you know, just to manage the internet and 100,000 people. Spending billions of dollars on the Great Firewall. All of this stuff, you know, makes it so that if it does have a big shock, it could go right over. 
Whereas in India, they have a big shock. People don't even notice. <laughs> because it's a federal country, loosely wound, it's democratic, nobody expects every part to perform particularly well together. So, I, but China's a different, different question. And it would lead to a massive suppression, which could lead to more instability. So that's, it's got a whole other catalog of problems. I'm not predicting anything. I'm only saying that I don't believe their model is quite the model, model par excellence that some people who just ride the high-speed rail and look at the skylines of Chinese cities might be, we want to conclude. Another question here, and then we've got two other questions that have been up. So we'll try to get to as many as we can. Internally, uh, China is undergoing an uh, anti-corruption campaign. Uh, however, those same efforts have also been characterized as a consolidation of power. <coughs> Would you uh, comment on that, please? You know, I think Xi Jinping is, uh, maybe some of his family members are not, but he is a, a pretty incorruptible man. I don't believe he's, you know, uh, in, in any way got his hand in the till. I think he's sincere about the corruption campaign. And it plays very well in China. People were really fed up with what was going on. And when you hear the stories of these guys that are busting, these generals, you know, have cat houses stacked with cash. It's like Scrooge McDuck. I mean, it's unbelievable when you hear the stories. Selling offices just the way they did in the Qing Dynasty. Um, on the other hand, it is undeniably true that Xi Jinping is a you know, knows how to fight behind closed doors and it's tough. And he's taken down a lot of people he doesn't like. The truth is in China, <coughs> almost anybody who is in high position, not everybody, but most people have been tempted by corruption because their salaries are low, there are no stock options, and they have this great opportunity to, to do it this other way. And, uh, this is what brought the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, down. And Xi Jinping knows this. Now, where this all goes, I don't know. People didn't think it could possibly last this long and net so many people. It's epic. But can you clean out the Augean stables? The system is corrupt. It's not just people. The system is corrupt. How do you deal with that? Right? Good luck, Xi Jinping. A question that uh, kind of goes along with the uh, somber note uh, here tonight. Uh, how come there hasn't been more publicity in the national media about this new missile that uh, China has developed with a number of letters I can't remember, but uh, that uh, can threaten uh, and uh, uh, take down, apparently, uh, our uh, aircraft carriers? That's the first question. The second, there could have been and should have been more publicity about the fact that they use our technology to have uh, uh, <coughs> submarines that are much quieter than our nuclear fleet because they use diesel, which we had developed but never used. Why is there more publicity about the threatening nature of some of this? Well, I think, first of all, uh, uh, the state of the American media is woeful. That would explain a big piece of the missing puzzle. Uh, television is basically an abomination when it comes to covering any of these issues in a comprehensive, thoughtful, serious way. So the fact that you don't know about it, unless you were to read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or the FT, the Guardian, something like that, a few of the papers that were made that still purport to, you know, have thoughtful coverage. It isn't simply market-driven. Television, you can just forget. I mean, NPR has done some good stuff. Um, I think that you mentioned the, the, the MIRV missiles, where they have multiple entry, uh, they, 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 so they can, one missile can target a number of targets. Uh, this has just been revealed that the Chinese have accomplished that. Um, it's Yes, it's a huge quantum leap forward in their ability to project power. 
And they've been making these, whether it's in outer space, whether it's an aircraft carrier, whether it's in <clears throat> new kinds of aircraft, they've been buying all sorts of the latest fighter bombers from the Russians, uh, developing a lot of very interesting new things themselves, buying avionics, you know, AWACS from the uh, uh, Israelis. They're really getting tricked out. And uh, our military is very smart, actually. I I'm really impressed with the brass. These guys are well-educated, thoughtful, by and large quite decent people, and they really do understand what's going on. But they're not policymakers. And uh, th that's another department. So the question is, all right, what do you do when the Chinese get nerves? I don't know. <laughs> what do you do? It's like, what do you do when China gets nuclear weapons? Do you go and bomb the smithereens? We tried that. You know, we tried that in Iraq, in Afghanistan. How did that work out? So. Uh, my question is: uh, Recently, the Department of Justice has filed uh, has filed uh, legal claims against six Chinese citizens uh, for stealing technology, and some of them were in the United States and were able to get arrested. Uh, how does this fit into the whole picture of the Chinese-U.S. relations? Well, this is a new wrinkle, cyber cyber hacking, uh, and it is a very vexing one because it, it, it is very troublesome to think that <clears throat> whoever these people are, and some are just hackers and some are government and some are military in China. Uh, I myself have had my own account hacked by the Chinese. And I know this because having been to the White House quite often, the FBI came to see me, as they sometimes do. Uh, and they said, well, you know, your, your account's been hacked. I said, well, I assume it. You assume that I assume everything I say, everything I send is, is, and I try to act very openly. And they said, well, we know because you send emails to the White House and we track everybody. We track everybody. Goes on. So this is very common. We, we do it too. What we don't do, as poor Obama tried to explain, uh, you know, our, we don't condone corporate hack. But we're hacking the daylights out of things otherwise, and you all know the litany. And, and, just pick up Edward Snowden and watch that film. So, I mean, this is the real world. But China does have a special problem. I do, I, I do think when it comes to intellectual property, um, I think we have to learn how to protect ourselves from asymmetrical warfare. If we don't want our power grids taken out by hostile forces, we better spend the money and, and protect them. If we don't want them getting into the White House email, you better get some computers that weren't put out there in the 1960s. Uh, you go into the State Department any place again, and you look at the computers, the IRS, oh my God, it's woeful. And, you know, if you were one of the people who believed that we want to put the, make the government so small we can put it in a bathtub and drown it, well, you're living in a fantasy world when it comes to addressing the problems of a place like China. You know, who's going to stand up to China for you? You have to ask these questions, particularly in the cyber question. Uh, it's, it's the new sort of frontier. And we don't know how it's going to work out. But it's very men menacing and very dangerous. It's less dangerous to have your intellectual property stolen, but people don't like it. And it's not right. And we haven't a very good way to control that. And it's been a long slog in the courts to get any restitution. One more quick idea. What, uh, can you uh, give us an idea of what you think is going to happen in Taiwan? Yeah, very interesting. Well, they're about to have an election. <coughs> and I think the <coughs> old Nationalist Party of Chiang Kai-shek, which was in office, and had made a kind of an accommodation with China, will be leaving power, and we're going to get something new. And, you know, Taiwan looks at what went on in Hong Kong, and I don't think there's a person on the island 
which thinks that's any model for that. It used to be this idea, one country, two systems, oh fine, you know, you know, don't, don't worry, just go about your life and have your little free press and, and your little government and we won't bother you. That's not the way it's shaking down. So I don't know what's going to happen. In a democracy, people get to do what they want to do, even when it's crazy. We know that. <laughs> and if the, you know, the Democratic Progressive Party gets in power and decides to have a referendum on independence, like Scotland or Quebec, or the Czech Republic, are you for that? No. You're not for self-determination. Oh, no, no, that's not what I was asking. No, no, I'm asking you, because if you're for it, I'm saying, uh-oh, uh, we've got some trouble in Taiwan because China will probably launch a missile attack. Sure they will, but we've also been sitting there doing lots of our stuff and uh, looking like we're going to boy them up. We're not about to. I mean, well, if China decides yeah. to take them, we're going to let them go. I mean, there's no way other thing we can Well, do. I mean, that's a good question. Is it a little bit like the Baltics? We're in NATO. If Putin comes in, what's NATO going to do? If China actually came in in an aggressive way to Taiwan, would the U.S. move? Yes. Well, yeah, we do it, and we should do something. I'm just... Yeah. Well, I, I don't know the answer to it. <coughs> I'm just saying we're reaching another inflection point in Taiwan, you asked, where one regimen is coming to an end, a new one is going to begin, and it's very uncertain, and it could lead anywhere. And there are plenty of places it could lead which will be unacceptable to Beijing. And then, trust me, Beijing isn't going to just say, well, gosh, we don't want to disturb the neighborhood here. They're going to do something. And it's going to be dangerous. We have gone a little over tonight, but we have one last question. Do we have time for one more? OK. <laughs> on, a, on a little uh, different note, what do you make and why do you think the Chinese uh, told the Dalai Lama that he has to reincarnate and according to their terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you well know, the Chinese Communist Party only allows atheists to be members, which qualifies them in, in the highest sense to be a monitor of Tibetan Buddhist practices involving reincarnation. Um, it's because China is a control society and they don't trust the Dalai Lama. He's a man of immense moral stand stature, and they recognize he's very, very dangerous. And if he gets to designate his reincarnation, that will be a force they will have to contend with for another lifetime. And they do not welcome that. Okay. Well, that's it. They told him that he has to reincarnate. He doesn't have a choice. Well, but he has to reincarnate, but they want to say who, who, who who he's going to reincarnate <laughs> and where that guy's going to come from. Now, not Don Sala or India. He'll be from Tibet and he'll be put in a box and, and, and you know. My local Lama says that uh, uh, the Dalai Lama has said publicly a number of times that he will not reincarnate. Chinese government can't make it back. No, but they can do something. You would be surprised what the Chinese government can do. They could have a process within Tibet whereby monks from his monastery you know, form a committee, wander around, pick a child, and say, oh. They already did that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you mean it didn't work? Well, nobody, from what I understand, the Tibetans don't particularly pay any attention to the one that the Chinese government came to. Yes, and they don't know where the other one is. Right. So it's well, a dead end. And, and allow me to interject by the high frequency of questions. I think we've had a fascinating talk tonight, and the book is for sale. Thank you, Dr.